if you're standing at the top looking for a seat, I've got about six seats right over here uh, to my left. And then I've got a couple more sprinkled in here toward the front. I've got... here. I got two in that row right there. One in the middle there. Are these? Is somebody? Yep, I've got about four more. Four more seats. Is that seat open? Okay. Pardon me. Okay, give me one minute. I got one in the corner right there. I've got one right there. Or right here. I've got two right there, and I've, are those open on either side of you? And I got two over there. Hello. All right, just one. Uh, a couple of real quick announcements. If you are here for GCP and you're looking for GCP credit, the presentation is over. Um, you can meet Tara out at the top of the stairs. You'll need to go out that top exit. If you're here for the biz ed classes, again, at the top of the stairs for you.
All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, this fall's edition uh, of our CEO Speaker Series, and it's great to have uh, all of you here with us. Uh, my name is David Spaulding. I'm the Ray's Beck Endowed Dean of the College of Business, and uh, it's been our pleasure to run this series off for a year now and have uh, six really great and dynamic CEOs uh, here to speak and interact uh, with our students. So, we're only a few weeks into the term, and it's been a, a term of, uh, of great announcements, great advancement for the College of Business. Uh, you know, as you may have heard, we announced uh, at the end of August uh, that we received a gift uh, from the Jardine family uh, to build an, uh, an addition to this building. And boy, do we need an addition to this building, right? Uh, so we've, uh, we received a $7 million gift from them. We're very pleased uh, that they continue to support us. Uh, and we expect to open the doors in four years, and probably all of you will have graduated. So, uh, but still, it's going to be great for the college, great to help us uh, continue to move forward and build our programs. Uh, then at the beginning of this week, uh, we announced a wonderful gift from Debbie and Jerry Ivey of $50 million uh, to our College of Business. And once the regents approve uh, this gift in October, uh, we will be named the Debbie and Jerry Ivey College of Business. Uh, and that'll make us the first college here to be named at Iowa State. Uh, and we're very excited about that and also very excited with uh, all the wonderful things we're going to be able to do for our students, our faculty, and our staff uh, with the wonderful endowment that we will build uh, out of the gift from the Ivies. So uh, it's been a great time for us, and, and the week continues to roll on with, uh, with a wonderful speaker today. So uh, the idea behind this series is to try to give our students the opportunity to really hear what it's like uh, in the corner office, uh, what it's like for a CEO, the path that a CEO follows, and have a chance to interact with the CEO. And there's always a good active uh, Q and A uh, in each one of these uh, in each one of these uh, discussions. Uh, we're featuring uh, Ken Sullivan, who's the CEO of Smithfield Foods, uh, which is a company that uh, that hires uh, a large number of Iowa State uh, graduates, uh, runs a great internship program, uh, and so we're pleased to have them ha have him here. Uh, as part of our Business Week uh, program. So, uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce uh, uh, the person who's going to, who really made this all possible, uh, and who's going to, uh, going to introduce uh, Ken, uh, uh, Sandra Alvarez. And Sandra is a, a student from Des Moines, uh, double majoring in supply chain management and marketing. Uh, she had an internship this summer with Smithfield Foods, and she was so impressed with the experience she had, she said, I want to get the big guy to come speak uh, on campus. And so it was really through her uh, good efforts that we invited Ken to be with us here today. So please welcome Sandra to introduce Ken. Thank you, Dean Spaulding, for that kind introduction. As the Vice President of the Multicultural Business Network, I feel honored that our organization is a co-sponsor for this special event. The Multicultural Business Network helps students develop professionalism, leadership, and networking skills by connecting students with employers. MBN has hosted companies such as John Deere, Union Pacific, Smithfield Foods, and more. As a club, we've also traveled to visit companies on site. We also volunteer for events such as Reggie Sleepout and football game concessions. Um, we also volunteer for other events in the College of Business such as Donuts with the Dean. I'd like to take a moment to briefly recognize members of the Multicultural Business Network. Would you please stand? Thank you. Smithfield Foods is a great company with a very organized internship program, which I highly recommend. As interns, we learned about the company and learn about working in the real world. But we did more than work. We made connections. At Smithfield, they really go out of their way to make interns feel involved and help us to get to know each other. We toured processing plants, attended our Kansas City Royals game, volunteered in the community, and completed a ropes course together. It was an amazing summer. An internship program can only be this successful when it has the support from leadership. That starts with the president and CEO. Mr. Sullivan is currently the president and chief executive officer of Smithfield Foods, Inc., a $15 billion global food company. 
He oversees Smithfield's vast businesses, including all the operations in the United States, Poland, Romania, Mexico, and the Uni United Kingdom. He joined Smithfield in 2003 as Vice President of Internal Audit. He held many roles in the company, including Chief Financial Officer and ultimately was named President and CEO. He is a graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University, where he earned a Bachelor's of Science in Accounting in 1988. He lives in Richmond, Virginia with his wife Suzanne and their three children. It is my pleasure to present the leader of the largest pork producer and pork processor in the world, who flew all the way from Virginia to be here today. Please join me in welcoming the President and CEO of Smithfield Foods, Mr. Kenneth Sullivan. Good afternoon, good evening, not sure which. I've got up at 3.30 this morning. I'm sort of blown away by the number of people in this room. I'm, I'm figuring there's either a lot of people who need jobs <coughs> Or you were drawn by the snappy title, which was, I think, uh, something like uh, Donut Salesman to CEO. Um, it's a true story, by the way. My first job was a donut salesman. I'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but, you know, the whole purpose, I think, of this lecture series, and thank you, Dean Spaulding, for sponsoring this. I think it is a, a very good thing uh, for students to engage with business leaders and to try and understand a little bit about what their path was and, and maybe uh, learn a few things. Um, you know, so my first uh, job here today is to try and teach you something right from the right from the start. My first task is I'm going to teach you how to give an effective presentation. The most effective way to get to have an effective presentation is to feed people. Let's bring out the donuts. <laughs> See, you like me already, right? I had no idea that that there were going to be this many. I think we've got. Six dozen donuts. Uh, I'm an accountant. I think that's 72 donuts. So if you're not real hungry, pass it to your neighbor. But I guess that's the second lesson I can impart. Is this mic on? Is it? Turn it up a little. it up yeah. all right I'm gonna let the commotion die down a little bit why don't we just leave the boxes and they can pass them or are they all gone already all right the second lesson I'm gonna teach you today is never come up short on the donuts and I I screwed up on that I apologize all right um, I don't have prepared remarks uh, today and so I'm hoping that this can be a little bit of an interactive session I thought I could start by telling you a little bit more about Smithfield. After all, Smithfield is very active here at Iowa State. We have uh, a number of professional programs. Uh, we, we send our managers here. Uh, we've got something called the Brown Belt Program and the Black Belt Program that we run through the Meat Sciences Department here at Iowa State. We send um, how many people a year, Larry, do we send through here? 75 to 100 uh, of our employees come here to Iowa State in a three or four week program uh, and uh, they really it's a wonderful program and, and if I think about the numbers of people that we've put through it it really is amazing we've got a lot of Iowa State uh, uh, grads that work for Smithfield I don't know what the numbers are but I know it's a big number um, so what I could do is talk to you a little bit about Smithfield just to give you a little bit of context uh, for who I am what my job is uh, and then then we'll talk a little bit more about my path to the CEO. And I've got um, um, something else a little bit unique that maybe I can do today, and then we'll open it up for, uh, for questions. So I'm going to start with a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know where the slides are. Where are they? Up in front of me? Okay, great. All right, great. So now I'm going to have to stand up here, cause, or, or is there a monitor? I can stand over here. All right. I stole these uh, these slides from an investor deck, uh, really from the Treasury Department. They've uh, been busy refinancing some of our bonds, and so I stole some of these slides. Let me see if I can do them justice. Um, I think the the first thing you need to know about Smithfield is we're a big company, uh, and this is think of this as an org chart. 
Um, we actually are a subsidiary of a Hong Kong-based company. I'll talk a, maybe a little bit more about that uh, later on. But suffice to say that Smithfield and what I'm responsible for uh, is that middle box, uh, the, the United States. Uh, we have investments in Mexico. We have uh, operations in Poland. We're the biggest meat company in Poland. We're the biggest meat company in Romania. So Central Europe is a big uh, spot for us, and uh, we've got some, uh, some things in the U.K., so my area of responsibility is, uh, are the, the sort of two things to the right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that particular org chart. I'm happy to take questions about it. Maybe I'll address some of it uh, a little bit at the end because I find that people are curious about the, the Chinese connection. Uh, and it's an interesting story, I think, particularly for a business school audience uh, to hear a little bit uh, more about that. But um, I'm not going to belabor that right now. Let me just tell you in broad terms who Smithfield is. We are the world's largest pork company. To put it in context, we're a vertically integrated company. We are producing or growing 21 million hogs around the world. Uh, and so we have farms throughout the United States and all the locations that uh, I talked about, whether that's Mexico, Poland, Romania, where we grow hogs. We're farmers. Uh, in addition to our own company farms, we work with thousands and thousands of uh, family farmers uh, here in the United States and in other countries to help grow our hogs. So 21 million hogs uh, a year is what we're growing on the farms. If you think about a value chain, you start with the hogs on the farm, you move those hogs into a meat plant uh, to be fabricated, if you will. That's a, a more, uh, let's say, PC term. Um, but uh, those hogs move to the plant uh, to be made into meat. Uh, fresh meat. Uh, and so in, we process 37 million hogs uh, around the world. If you think about that number, it's a pretty astounding number. Uh, and I'll talk about what our assets are around the world and how exactly we get that done. Uh, moving, continuing down the, uh, the, the value chain, if you think about that second piece, the world's largest pork, pork producer, that's fresh meat. Again, think of that as the, you go to the grocery store and you see the pork chop in the meat case. The next piece here, the top producer of packaged pork, that's bacon and sausage and ham, the things that have been processed a little bit. Uh, and we are producing three and a half billion pounds of uh, product uh, globally. And finally, that culminates in about $15 billion of sales, and we've got thousands of customers. I'll show you a little bit uh, more about that here in a moment. Uh, this is a map simply trying to show our operations. The, the purple is meat plants. The, the yellow uh, um, icons are farms. These are really farm centers because the reality of, is we've got thousands and thousands of assets that are spread throughout these major areas. I'm not going to belabor that. Let me give you some context here. Let me, let me first talk about the U.S. business. Again, this chart is really aligned with the value chain. Think about the, growing the hogs, putting them into a meat plant, making pork chops, and then ultimately making bacon. If you think about it in those simple terms, that's what that, those three uh, quadrants are. In terms of the farms, we are the largest hog producer in the United States. We've got a 15% market share. That's more than uh, twice the size of the next uh, three competitors. Uh, we've got 897,000 sows, that, that may not mean a lot to uh, a lot of business students, but if you're from the ag school, maybe that means something to you. Uh, suffice to say that in the United States, we're producing about 16 million hogs just here in the United States. Many of those hogs, by the way, right here in Iowa, are finished uh, right here um, in, in Iowa. Uh, we've got literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of company-owned farms and uh, a couple thousand contract farms. Moving to the center slide. Pork processing, that's again the fresh meat plant. Uh, we are the w leader by a wide margin. In other words, we are the biggest uh, pork processor in the country. Um, we've got a 26% market share. We grew this company over a 25 year period and we started out in 1985 as being having a 2% market share. We've now got a 26% market share. That's big enough where the government's not gonna let us get much bigger for antitrust uh, reasons. Again, processing 31 million hogs just right here in the United States. We have a, a plant in North Carolina, in Tar Heel, North Carolina, where we process about 32,000 hogs a day uh, at that uh, particular plant. 
Moving to the right, the packaged pork, uh, we are the biggest, suffice to say. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at we are the number one supplier to the retail chain. Think of that as the grocery stores. Uh, and uh, we're the number one supplier to food service. Think about that as the restaurant chains and, uh, and all the food service distributors uh, that distribute uh, product to uh, mom and pop stores and restaurants across the country. Let me put it in context for you. This chart shows food service channel, that is sales that we're selling to restaurants. It's sales that we're selling to distributors that sell to restaurants. We have a number one share of bacon. That's in the food service on the top. If you look at, oh, I have a pointer here, I guess I can't point, but um, on the bottom, we've got the retail channel. That's, again, the Walmarts, the Kroger's, the, uh, we're the big grocery stores out here. hy V's, hy V's a great customer of ours. Um, uh, we have a 41% market share. What does that mean? If you think about that, and again, you're, you're in the business school, that is a tremendous market share. And what it really says is we make more bacon than anybody in the world. We sell more bacon than anybody in the world. The reality is if you're eating bacon, whether it's at the commissary, whether it's at uh, McDonald's, whether it's at... Uh, uh, you name the store, there's a very good chance that bacon came from a Smithfield plant somewhere. I'm not going to belabor the point on this, uh, on this slide, but suffice to say that in the fresh pork uh, area in, in food service, we're number one, we're number one in hams, we're number one in barbecue, breakfast sausage, and we're number two in hot dogs. We've got to do something about that number two. I don't like that. Um, let me, I'm going to skip this. This is really just talking about our fresh pork um, uh, also, let me, let me explain Smithfield in this context. This slide, I think, says it all. This is, an, this is a slide that we put together, and we could come up with, a, with 30 more pages just like this. If you look at the retailers, Walmart, Kroger, Costco, HEB, Meyer, Dollar General, Aldi, all the big names, the bottom line is we sell to everybody. Everybody is our customer. I can't think of a single major retailer in the top 30 that we don't have as a customer. In the middle, food service. Uh, again, these are food service distributors, the big houses, Cisco, U.S. Foods, PFG. Uh, the names go on and on. We sell to these uh, companies. These are our customers. Moving to the right in the restaurant channel, whether it's Subway, McDonald's, Waffle House, you have Waffle House out here? You got Dunkin' Donuts, I know, because we just bought some uh, donuts. But uh, the point is, no matter where you go, you're likely to run into Smithfield. Whether you know it or not, uh, you're likely eating some pork product that's come from Smithfield somewhere. So we're ubiquitous. We're everywhere. Um, and we're proud of that uh, fact. And as I said, this is just a, an example slide. We could come up with uh, a couple more slides, several more slides just like that all of which would be household names that you would recognize. I think that, to me, is the best way to sort of explain who Smithfield is. I've got other slides here. It talks about our investments in, uh, in Poland and Romania. I would just tell you our Poland and Romania business is a billion and a half dollar business. Uh, it's a good business for us. It's, um, it really, uh, Poland and Romania are the Midwest, if you will, of Europe. Uh, and it's kind of the breadbasket of Europe. So that Central European swath that we operate in uh, is very good from our, from our standpoint. Uh, there's low-cost feed grains there, uh, and uh, there's good demand for pork products. I'm not going to belabor uh, these other slides because they talk about our investments in, um, in uh, various countries. Uh, th the last thing I would tell you about Smithfield is we are a, a company that takes our um, obligation to the community, uh, to society, uh, very seriously. That wasn't true, I would tell you. 25 years ago at Smithfield, the plain fact, if I'm dead honest about it, that wasn't true. Uh, we had a little bit of a cultural revolution, I would say, over the last uh, 14 or 15 years. There's a couple of people that came to Smithfield that I think uh, deserve most of the credit for that. Uh, but I would, I would tell you that today, these sustainability uh, pillars, whether it's our animal care or environment, uh, uh, food safety, people, helping communities, all of these things are, th are things that we take very seriously and we're very active in, in all of these 
and frankly, I think we're the industry leader in animal agriculture in all of these pillars. I think we were the first to do it. I think we, we do things like uh, last year we announced a greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction. We're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by the year 2025. That's an enormous target. It's an enormous goal. Uh, but I think we can do it, and we've got people focused on it, and we're the first animal agriculture company to do that, and it's apolitical. I don't know whether it's climate, I don't care whether it's climate change. We're doing it because it's really uh, efficiency. Uh, that, to me, is what sustainability really is about. It's being efficient in everything that you do. And if we can be more efficient, uh, whether it's on our hog farms dealing with the hog waste or whether it's in our plants, uh, that's what we're going to do. So. I would just tell you that uh, we're proud of our sustainability pillars, and at this point, it's become uh, a part of our cultural identity of who we are. Did you hear something about that this summer, Sandra? Yeah. All about it. That's good. Love to hear that. Okay. I would tell you, I've, I've got more slides in there. I'm not going to waste your time really talking about that. I just really wanted to give you some sense of who Smithfield is, uh, and I think that probably gives you some sense of who we are. We're the pork guys. Is, uh, is really who we are. So, you know, the, the balance of what we can do today is um, the whole point of this series, I think, is to, is to learn from business leaders and to hear from business leaders about their path uh, to the CEO suite. Uh, and as I thought about that on the plane on the way out here, and admittedly I didn't do uh, advanced preparation, I was on the airplane, I was prepping for this, uh, I thought about a commencement speech that I gave not too long ago, uh, and I, as I thought about it, I thought that really I said a lot of things in that commencement speech that I would want to try and communicate or convey to you uh, today, and so it's a little bit uh, unorthodox and unconventional, but what I'd like to do is read from this uh, commencement speech. You're not graduating, bad news, uh, although some of you are on the verge of, we, we had some discussion. Um, that's a good thing. I've got two in college myself. I've got one who's got one semester left and one's got two years left. So um, I, know, uh, I know you're uh, anxious to get out there in the real world and, and uh, we're anxious to have you come to work at Smithfield. Um, what I thought is I'd do is I'd read from this uh, commencement speech because frankly it tells a little bit about what my path is and what my journey was. You're going to have to sort of imagine with me a little bit here because again this speech was not uh, directed at you it was not intended for you and you're going to have to you know make a little mental adjustment when I talk about certain things and sort of try and apply it to your own situation and I'm only going to take about five minutes or ten minutes at most uh, in reading certain excerpts of that uh, but I, I do want to do that and I'm just going to launch into that this was again a commencement speech that I gave to some really these were high school graduates uh, and uh, what, what I tried to tell them was that success in life and success in business uh, is really about a couple of things in my estimation, uh, one of which is forward momentum. And I tried to tell the story of you need to keep moving forward. It doesn't matter what you achieve this semester in your grades. It doesn't matter what you achieve uh, maybe on the athletic field. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. No one cares. Uh, and, and what I tried to tell them was forward momentum is a big deal. I tried to tell them attitude is a big deal. And, uh, and I, I've got some other points in here that uh, I think will come out as I read it. So I'm going to jump sort of almost halfway into this uh, and then I'm going to read some excerpts and then we'll see how that comes out. How about that? I'm going to have to wear some glasses. I'm at that age where I can't see a thing without my glasses. And I'm going to tell you right away, I'm not fashion forward. These are, these are Costco glasses that I buy by the dozen. How many people I have my age in here that, that need these things? My wife and I buy these literally by the dozen and leave them around the house. So again, imagine you're listening to this from a standpoint and from really, it's not far off for you, right? Because you're either about to graduate or you will in the next few years. Uh, and so think of this as, a, as advice. So what I told these students was the first thing I wanted them to know 
and this is going to sound harsh, very harsh, I know, but from tomorrow onward, the great, big, wondrous world you're about to enter, that, doesn't that sound like a commencement speech, uh, likely will not know about or even care about the, thi the great things you've done so far. The big world outside of Ames will not care about, let me make sure I got this right, your championships that you played basketball, that you scored a touchdown to beat Iowa, although I think people would care about that. Right? <laughs> or what you accomplished or didn't accomplish in high school. In the big world, no one will care and neither should you. Note what I said. No one will remember or care what you accomplished or didn't accomplish in your, in your studies and up until this point. In other words, you're embarking on a new race today. And it's not where you start the race, it's how you finish it. It doesn't matter what happened during the last four years. What matters most is the next four years, this idea of forward momentum, and the next four years after that, and so on and so on. It's important you understand that while the world you're about to enter is a beautiful place filled with tremendous opportunity, it's also fast-paced and unforgiving. One of the secrets to success is maintaining forward momentum and never living in the past. Momentum is in life is as important in life as it is in athletics. The point is, it's important to move forward. Always move forward in life. You can't let your past accomplishments or failures define you. If you allow them to define you, they will. I have some experience with this topic. You see, 34 years ago, I was seated exactly where you're seated. I sat in the audience as a graduating senior and a proud member of the 1982 Virginia Boys State Basketball Champions. We beat Booker T. Washington in the championship game, starring local legend Bruce Smith. How many people remember Bruce Smith from the NFL? You do. <laughs> you and I are contemporaries. So. Uh, he went on to star in the NFL, and, you know, I was hot stuff. You should have seen me in that championship game. I scored 43 points. Every facet of my game was working, inside, outside, left hand, finger rolls, mid and long range jumpers, dunks, you name it. I could dunk as well as any six foot five suburban white kid that you've ever seen. <laughs> I'm talking this much above the rim. I was on fire. Everything was working for me. Now, as my wife likes to remind me, those 43 points were scored in warm-ups. Before the actual game, it was nobody guarding me at all. But leaving that aside, leaving aside the debate about whether it's to fair to count those warm-up points, being a state champion in basketball was big-time stuff to a high school kid. It made me feel and my teammates feel special. And the reality is we were special, but only in that moment in time. After graduation, the adulation we'd earned quickly dissipated. Indeed, aside from our parents, everybody else quickly forgot. The reality is being a high school state champion never helped me with anything later in life. It didn't help me graduate from college. It didn't help me get a job. It didn't help me with the ladies, and God knows I could have used some help. It didn't help me with anything. To be truthful, I never thought much about being a state champion after I left high school. When I think about my classmates that have done well after high school, again, if you can substitute college, please, uh, I think about the common denominator is their greatest accomplishments have all come after school. Those that haven't fared well didn't keep their forward momentum. Some allowed their school experience to define them, and I'm here today urging you to turn the page and always move forward. Be proud of what you've accomplished, but understand much greater things lie ahead, and if you have the courage to move forward and pursue them, your life will be better. High school, graduation is an important milestone in your life, and you should be proud of yourself. But remember, when you leave here, it's only a milestone. It's not the finish line. To be successful in life, you need to keep yourself working towards the next goal. Always looking ahead, always moving forward, always engaged in something that will take you to the next level. It's called forward momentum. An old expression comes to mind. If your past accomplishments loom large, 
in the rear view mirror, you're not going fast enough. Which leads me to the second main message point for today. This is really going to sound like a uh, commencement speech, but you can be anything you want to be. That sounds like a trite platitude uttered at countless graduation exercises across the country. But it's a platitude because there's a universal truth to it. That's how something becomes a platitude, by the way. I don't care if you're the valedictorian or you finish last in your class. You control. You control how your life turns out. You get to choose. Grandma Moses said it best, life is what we make it. Always has been, always will be. How do I know? I know because I'm a living, breathing example. Again, 34 years ago, I was sitting right where you are. I didn't graduate with honors. In fact, I was honored to graduate. <laughs> That's a joke. I wasn't that bad a student. But I didn't set out to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and there was nothing about me at the time that would have caused somebody to predict that I might one day lead a giant global company like Smithfield Foods. I was an average kid. But I was an average kid with an above average understanding of the keys to success. What are the keys to success? Surely, sure, there are the typical ingredients everyone talks about, hard work, education, good citizenship, etc. I'm not discounting any of those. But let me tell you about the two things I've found to be most important. Self-reliance and attitude. First, self-reliance. Be a self-starter. Take initiative. Just like Sandra took initiative to get me here today, she just woke up, decided, I'm going to get him here. She made it happen. Your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, the government, none of them owe you a thing. Indeed, you owe them a debt of, of gratitude for getting you this far for caring for you when you could not care for yourself. But by graduating, society is telling you you have the skills to care for yourself. Believe it. You're young. You're strong. You will never have more energy or enthusiasm. Am I right? you never have more hair or brain cells than you have today. So go out. Take charge of your life. Don't look to anybody but yourself. No, one, no more waiting on somebody else to do something or to make something happen. You are that person. Once you realize it's you, it's liberating, and success comes much easier. Second, attitude. What is attitude? It's energy and enthusiasm. It's smiling. It's body language. It's walking with a purpose rather than dragging yourself around. It's having a can-do attitude rather than a no-can-do attitude. Let me tell you a quick story about how I applied these principles. My path to success has been a bit unconventional, and perhaps some of you can benefit from hearing it. I was the last of seven children. My mother was an immigrant. My father died when I was your age. I had to, <clears throat> excuse me, I had to work my way through college. I didn't start out with much. I didn't go to Harvard or the Wharton School of Business. In fact, I went to Northern Virginia Community College and later, only later to Virginia Commonwealth University. It took me six years to work my, excuse me, my way through college. Along the way, I've been a Krispy Kreme donut salesman. It's a true story. I'll tell you about that. Do you, do you have Krispy Kreme out here? Uh, dishwasher, delivery man, shoe salesman, carpenter's helper, electrician's helper, roofer, painter, laborer, CPA, and something even called a slump tester. Don't ask me what that is, but... With the sole exception of the donut salesman job, I enjoyed success in every one of those early jobs. And the donut gig didn't work out because I ate too many of my product. But I succeeded not because I was the smartest guy around. I succeeded because I brought a positive attitude to all those jobs. I applied the principles just outlined. That is, show up on time, work with energy and enthusiasm, walk with a purpose, smile when I need to, and always, and I always wanted to be the guy who got things done rather than the person explaining why something couldn't be done. I cared about whether, whether what I was doing and whether I was doing a good job. I cared about what my boss thought of me. I cared. 
That's what I want for you. I want you to go forth with a positive attitude. Uh, and then I talked about one last piece of advice. And that is don't make the same mistake twice. Try not to make the same mistake twice. Um, I have a story, a wildly inappropriate story, about the time I actually got into bed with my wife's parents. That is a true story when I was your age. You see me afterwards, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story. It's funny. Uh, it might be the most entertaining thing I could tell you, but the dean would be upset with me if I told that story here. Without going into details, let me just say this. I didn't make that mistake twice. <laughs> the point is, you're going to make mistakes. That's fine. It's called growing up. And God knows I made my fair share of mistakes along the way. But what I didn't do, and what most successful people don't do is make the same mistake twice. Once is a mistake, twice is a conscious decision. And so these were the sort of words that I tried to impart to these you know, graduating high school students that, that uh, I wanted to try and somehow weave into my comments today because I think from my standpoint, um, I think life and success in business is about applying some of these principles. Um, I know that at every step of the way, when I've uh, progressed in my career um, and I look back on it, I, I think that, um, that I applied these principles and it was noticed. Um, so let me give you a little bit more flavor and a little bit more color on my career path. I did go ultimately to VCU. I graduated with an accounting degree and became a CPA. I went to work for Arthur Anderson. Uh, I was telling a story upstairs, I guess I'll tell it here. Um, you know, one of the hardest jobs you can get is your first job. It's the hardest job to get. It's the most important job you'll ever get is your first job. I went to school at VCU. VCU uh, was um, a fine school, but it wasn't a top school. Um, I, I grew up in Virginia. Uh, we have got great schools, William & Mary. Uh, UVA, we've got uh, Georgetown right over across the bridge. We've got tremendous schools uh, around where I grew up. I didn't go there. Uh, I had a very different uh, college experience. My wife and I have known each other since we were 12 years old. Uh, we were essentially together through college. I worked my way through college, <clears throat> and I just had a sort of a different experience, certainly, than my kids are having um, uh, in college. My point is, when I graduated, um, I wanted to get a job with what was then the big eight uh, firms. And now today, for those of you in the business school and uh, know anything about the accounting firms, it's the big four firms. Uh, at the time, Arthur Anderson, uh, which is now defunct, sadly, um, was the blue chip firm. It was the best of the best. And I wanted to try to get a job at Arthur Anderson. Somehow, uh, I had a friend who had gone to UVA who had been recruited by Arthur Anderson at UVA, uh, and is my contemporary, he somehow got me an interview uh, with, with uh, you know, a more senior person, a partner at, uh, at Arthur Anderson. And I jumped at that opportunity, and um, I can remember it very clearly. Um, uh, as, I, as I said to you, uh, or alluded to in the remarks there, I had a lot of different jobs in college. I did work my way through college. Uh, one summer, I worked for a contractor. Uh, he had me do several roofs. Uh, and so I was tearing off roofs and putting on new asphalt shingles. Um, so I did that for him for one summer and figured I could do it for myself. Uh, the next summer, I passed out flyers and uh, waited for the phone to ring. And uh, sure enough, it did ring. Uh, and, and I got some jobs, by the way, uh, I would get some phone calls, and I would go over and look at the house, and I'd look at the pitch on the roof, and I'd go, I'm not doing that job. Because <laughs> uh, I'm actually a little bit, uh, believe it or not, I'm a little bit afraid of heights. But um, uh, if the roof was too high or too steep, I'd just say I'm not interested in the job. But um, anyway, I was a roofer during college. That's what I did to make money. Um, so along comes my opportunity with Arthur Anderson, and I'm sitting in the office, uh, and this woman, Becky Ruff was her name, uh, I'm there not 30 seconds and the phone rings and she picks up the phone and she's oh no that's oh no she's clearly distraught clearly something's wrong 
uh, and I'm thinking, great, I, uh, I make it all this way, uh, and now you know my interview is going to be shot because she's got a personal problem or something like that. She hangs up the phone and she says, "I'm sorry, that was my husband. We got a leaking roof." I said, "I can help you with that," uh, and that's what happened. That is the story, really, of how I got my first job at Arthur Anderson. Uh, is I went over her house that night and I fixed her roof. <laughs> and, <laughs> and about uh, uh, a week later, I had a job offer from Arthur Anderson. Um, but uh, again, the, the, the point is that uh, when I got to Arthur Anderson, I'm, I'm here now, I got the job, but I'm starting with this class of UVA grads, Georgetown grads, etc. cetera. Uh, and frankly, I was, uh, I wouldn't say I was intimidated, uh, but I was uh, maybe wondering uh, if my education at VCU would sort of stack up and measure up. And um, what I quickly learned, uh, and it's one thing that you'll learn when you get in the, in the, uh, in the, the workplace, is that there are different kinds of smarts. And there were certainly people that were very, let's call it book smart. Um, you know, there's this thing called emotional uh, intelligence uh, that uh, a lot of uh, you know, business schools even talk about. Um, and, and what I would tell you is a lot of my peers uh, that started at Arthur Anderson that I was uh, in competition with, frankly, and, and a little bit worried that did they know more than I did, um, it became clear to me right away that they didn't have good social skills, some of them, not, not all of them. Of course, there were some brilliant people uh, that, that went to work for Arthur Anderson, people far smarter than I was uh, and better than I was. But, but what they didn't, what they lacked were, were social skills, communication skills. And, and I would tell you of the single biggest thing, if you want to work on something, it is how to engage somebody in a conversation. You know, I've interviewed probably Two, two or 3,000 people in my life over the, over the course of my life for different jobs. Uh, and I would tell you, you know, the first, you know, 50 or so, I probably stuck to the script and did the typical uh, job interview and asked them about their experience and asked them technical questions and things like that. And uh, I quickly uh, abandoned that approach because I came to learn that the single biggest determinant, I think, of success is those people who can engage on a personal level, who have great communication skills, great personal skills. Certainly, written communication skills helps, no question about it. In whatever endeavor you're going to be involved in, if you write well, it reflects well on you. If you write poorly, it reflects poorly on you. People's perceptions are formed by how you write, how you communicate, how you engage with people. So these principles that we talked about, about having a positive attitude, smiling, walking with a purpose, you can see there's a big difference right, between somebody who sort of, you know, tell, you tell them to do something, they sort of walk like that, and somebody who walks over there with a purpose and gets it done. People notice that, uh, and, and I guess I'm telling you and, and, and urging you uh, that as you go out into the workplace, the single biggest favor you can do yourself is things like smile and things like walk with a purpose and things like care. Get to the office before your boss and leave after you know, I know that's an old-fashioned concept and not, not necessarily uh, one that's m maybe in vogue. I don't know. Uh, Dean Spaulding can tell you that when he came up, I'm sure that was the uh, protocol. You simply, you simply didn't leave uh, before your boss. And I still believe that those principles, if you apply them today, you'll have an advantage because for whatever reason, uh, even though I think kids today are a lot smarter uh, than, than uh, I was when I graduated, I think about you know, my kids and, and the things that they've been exposed to and the curriculum that, that they uh, have to attack, um, I think they're smarter. But I think there are limitations to, to that. And again, I think that some of the cultural changes that we've experienced, uh, I think ultimately uh, are a disadvantage to my kids, um, whether it's the smartphones and, you know, just the idea of constantly, you know, being engaged in that, I, I do think it's detracted from people's ability to engage on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'm not here as some, you know, old guy saying you guys are all, you know, you young guy, you young punks need to, you know, stop what you're doing. Uh, I'm simply saying to you as a business person, uh, people take note. They do notice. Uh, and so work on those communication skills. Engage people. 
um, as I, I started to tell you the story about the interviewing, uh, I just gave the, all that up. All I do now when I interview somebody is I want to have a conversation with them. I want to sit across from that person for 45 minutes and see if we can hold a conversation. I want to see what they do when there's a pause uh, because these are the skills that ultimately end you in the corner office. It's not because I'm the smartest guy at Smithfield. I assure you I am not. Uh, but what, what, I, what I am able to do is I'm able to see a bigger picture, and that brings me to another point I wanted to talk to you about, uh, th uh, another principle I think that's important as you go out into the, the workplace, I call it the lemonade stand principle. Um, and that is, no matter where you go to work, you have to understand the fundamentals of that business. And, you know, Smithfield is a $15 billion multinational. We have all kinds of externalities that impact our business on a daily basis, whether it's, whether it's geopolitical issues, trade issues, have major impacts on us whether it's commodities that have major impacts on us. I can walk in the office in the morning and the commodity board, the corn board, the hog board will change and my P&L is changed by $100 million by the time I leave, I leave the office. There are so many complicated externalities to our business uh, that really you have to deal with, but at a certain level, you always have to take a step back and I call it the, the lemonade stand principle. Business is no more complicated than a lemonade stand. When you had a lemonade stand, you had to buy inputs, and then you had to sell that, uh, your, your product. You had to make it, and then you had to sell it. You had to find customers, and you had to sell it for more than, you, more co than it cost you. That's, that's a basic business principle, right? You need to make money in business. You need to sell your product for more than you paid for it. So. What most people don't do when they go to work for a big company is try and understand the economics of that business. So Smithfield, big $15 billion company. Well, how do you get your arms around a $15 billion P&L? Pretty simple. You raise a hog, you sell that in the meat, and then you sell it in the bacon. If you take a step back and think, all right, well, what did it cost me to just to raise a single hog? How much does it cost to raise a hog? And you, you determine that that's, you know, $150. And then you determine, okay, well, we sell all the cuts of meat off that hog for $200. Uh, and then we convert some of that into bacon. We sell that. In other words, you don't have to be a genius to figure out what the economics of a business are, even though it's a big global enterprise. At a certain level, it's a lemonade stand. you got inputs, and you got to sell that for more than, than, uh, than you bought it for. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm telling you, our business is as complicated as it gets. We've got derivatives. We've got complicated hedging strategies. At the end of the day, all those things are all about what do we pay for it and what are we selling it for. And I, and I would submit to you that if you think about business in terms of a lemonade stand, it's really going to help you. And so, you know, at Smithfield, for example, if you begin to understand those basic economics of, okay, I'm just going to reduce this to a simple one hog. You know, how much is the hog, the, the meat, that kind of thing. And then if you know the volumes, like I talked about, you know, we do 32 million hogs in the United States. If all of a sudden you know, oh, we're making $10 a head. We make $10 for every pig. Okay, well, if you do 32 million pigs, that's $320 million. All of a sudden now, you're understanding the economics of the business. And by the way, that puts you in a different class. It puts you in a different category. It puts you in the executive suite. It puts you in a position to be able to talk about the business. Because what young people tend to do is they get focused on their area and they're, they're looking at this spreadsheet and they know they gotta put this number over here and they gotta make it over there and that's sort of, you know, they go home at night and they don't think much more about it. You've got to think much more about it. You've gotta understand the economics of the business and think of it always in the context of a lemonade stand. No more complicated than that. I, you, you can apply apply that to any uh, particular industry uh, or principle. You agree, Dean? Okay, I've talked uh, probably too much. Um, why don't we throw it open for some questions? I, I probably didn't do an adequate job, really, of uh, covering my career path. I told you I went to work for Arthur Anderson uh, in, in uh, the Washington, D.C. office. I stayed there and really worked for Arthur Anderson on and off for about uh, 10, 10 years. Um, and um, I 
uh, really worked my way through a, a series of financial jobs. I've been at Smithfield for 15 years, uh, and it's true, I did actually go to Smithfield as, a, as an internal audit, vice president of internal audit. That was at a very unique time in this country, uh, something that, uh, that you, you, uh, you're too young to really recall, but you know, when we had some pretty high profile business failures, including Enron, which ironically you know, ended up taking Arthur Anderson down, um, there were a lot of reforms in this country, uh, you know, business reforms, Sarbanes-Oxley is maybe something you've heard about. Uh, and uh, I went to Smithfield at a time when those reforms were in full swing and the skill set that I had at the particular time because I'd worked at Arthur Anderson for 12 years or 10 years, I guess, um, were in demand. Uh, and I, really, I worked in the audit function for, uh, I think, three years, and then I became the chief accounting officer, and then I became uh, uh, in charge of finance, and then the CFO job, and ultimately um, the, uh, the CEO job. But I would tell you, that the, the secret uh, to, to that success is thinking in those big terms of uh, just how this company makes money. Don't, don't go home at night unless you know how your company uh, makes money. You gotta understand it. If you, if you don't, you're uh, a cubicle dweller. I guarantee you that. So how about questions? Yes. Who do I find influential? You know, I'm not, I'm, to be totally candid, and, and maybe I'm showing myself here, but I, I've never been a big uh, reader of the business journals. I mean, I certainly I read the paper, the you know, Wall Street Journal uh, every day, but, you know, the, the management, how-to books, and those sorts of things, I've never really paid much attention to those, to be, to be honest with you. I, I, I think they're fine. I think, you know, but I think at some level, management's intuitive. And, and I think you, you know, you, again, it comes back to this idea of interacting with people. Management is about people. Uh, and if you know how to engage with people and you know how to motivate people and you know how, what makes people tick, you know, that's really management. And, you know, all the other stuff is sort of strategies around that. Um, so that's probably a poor answer to uh, maybe a good question. Maybe I'd have to think about that um, a little bit more. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, I'm sure you've had some stressful times, some dark times, uh, and how do you cope with that? I, I would tell you, for me, the last uh, 48 hours have been a little trying, a little stressing. Uh, and and I'll, I'll tell you something that you may or may not be aware of, you're probably not. Um, um, w we just recently had, uh, I'll call it a dust up, um, with, a, with uh, Richard Petty Motorsports. Uh, and um, um, that's been a trying thing. So uh, as part of our marketing programs, uh, we have sponsored a car. Um, a race car, uh, and we've spent a tremendous amount of money doing that, tens of millions of dollars a year, uh, over $100 million over the last five years, and we've had a good relationship uh, with Richard Petty, and I have nothing bad to say about uh, Richard Petty, um, but our contract expired, uh, and unfortunately, it's sort of devolved into, um, you know, some sort of accusations being made, if you will, uh, when the contract, when we announced that we were leaving that particular team and going to another, uh, there were assertions being made that we actually had a handshake deal and that we reneged on it. Um, you know, for any business person, I think for any decent person, uh, when your integrity is sort of called into question and, uh, and really impugned, um, that is uh, not fun. Uh, and so uh, I've been dealing with that uh, for the last uh, 48 hours. Uh, and of course, in today's world, with social media and everything, there's you know that thing blows up, and there's all kinds of people with opinions, right? And uh, the, the unfortunate thing about social media is that uh, it's a huge platform, uh, but it's a huge platform given to some people who have no idea what they're talking about, uh, and and uh, that's just the reality of the technological world that we live in. Um, so I would tell you. Um, the last 48 hours have been stressful in that regard. And, and also, 
over the weekend, somebody sent me a, uh, a Facebook post. It was called Vegan Art. And, um, you know, the, the, the truth is, I don't care whether you're a vegetarian or not. I eat meat, but, but I could care less whether you eat meat or not. Uh, it's, it's sort of, you know, everybody's personal prerogative. But there are people out there who dislike animal agriculture intensely uh, and believe that animal rights should be on par with human rights, literally on par with, with human rights. That's fine. That's their, you know, they're, they're entitled to their belief. Uh, but uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, Facebook post that I was sent has a picture of me. You know, it says a stick man. It's Ken Sullivan, CEO. And, uh, and it basically is depicting Smithfield you know, pouring some like noxious liquid down somebody's throat, and the caption is like Smithfield, you know, polluting uh, the world or some something like that. And it's aggravating uh, because I come to work at Smithfield. I know the people at Smithfield. Uh, they have you know the greatest integrity. They are people, many of whom went to Iowa State uh, and majored in animal agriculture and food science and meat science. And these are good people uh, and don't deserve. Uh, to you know, to be sort of painted as murderers, uh, which is what you know some people who don't eat meat would would uh, sort of portray us as. Again, I have no issue. In fact, my daughter was a vegetarian for five minutes until she you know, got, got 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 hungry. I, I don't care. Well, you know, I, I do object, I guess, to to uh, people who don't critically think uh, about what they're saying and have really no idea what they're saying. So. My point is, you asked me a question, how do you deal with stress? I'm just pointing out to you in the last, you know, 24, uh, 72 hours, uh, those things bother me. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you've got to take a step back and um, you've just got to recognize that no matter what you say, uh, there are some people who just won't be placated, they won't be satisfied. Uh, so I, I would also tell you that on a personal level, I try to exercise. And I think exercise is a... Um, is a panacea for a lot of things, um, and I'm not trying to, you know, sell gym memberships. I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I believe I, my personal belief is exercise is really more for the mind. I know it is for me personally. Um, I've, I've sort of, you know, worked out um, since I was in college, uh, and I, I find that if I go, you know three, four, five days without working out, it drives me insane, not from my body standpoint, from my, from my mental uh, standpoint. And, and I just am a big believer, whether you run, whether you lift weights, whether you, you know, whatever you do, um, I just think it's, uh, you know, yes. Oh, one more minute, one more question. Yes, up there. Uh -huh. So the question was, did I dream of becoming CEO or CFO? Um, I think it's fair to say I did not. You know, when I was your age, I didn't s sit there and say, I'm going to become the CEO and, and here's the path I'm going to try to pursue to do it. Um, it, it evolves over time. Certainly, I, I had a desire to be successful, no question about it. I had a uh, desire to try and uh, outwork people. Um, and, you know, just over time, I think you find yourself, if you do that at each step of the way, apply these principles we talked about, you'll find yourself being moved along in your career. Uh, and so, no, I didn't set out uh, to, 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 uh, to achieve that. Although at some point, you know, when you're in your 40s, you start to think about those things. And maybe I did a little bit at that point. Ken, thank you very much. Okay, good. So thank you all for joining us. We've got uh, a book about Iowa State for you to take back with you. And uh, have this in your office so when all the Iowa State folks come by, they can get a little taste of home. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I wish I hadn't done Yeah, I wish I hadn't done that. I'm not sure this was uh, done which. this. Uh, no, I, I, I think it was a good message. How you doing? Good, good. Yeah. Sure.
You wanna you wanna do that now, or you wanna wait till uh, till uh, people fil filter out? Hey. Mr. Sullivan, I'm on a double D. I work for Smithfield, and I actually have the high B account. I'm in tax and sales, so I awesome. just wanted to stop and thank you for coming out. Awesome. You, had a great time. you live here? No, I live in Kansas City. Kansas City. She leaves our Iowa State recruiting. I'm Harvard. Oh, good. Okay, good. And good. I'm part of Dan Huber. Oh yeah. Do the buy. Yeah, yeah. Of Thanks course. For coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer Hi. Ellie. I'm in the Hi, Career Jennifer. Foundations Program at Smithfield Booth. I actually graduated from Iowa State last year. Are you in Smithfield? Uh, no, actually I'm with Here? Anna oh, in okay. the Kansas City office. Okay, so. all right. Yeah. I need to get out there more frequently. It's, uh, I don't know, schedules are busy. But, uh, yeah, so let us know. We'll have some cost readers ready for you. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for we coming. I really appreciate you coming. And honestly, on a personal note, that speech came at a perfect time for me, so I really appreciate you coming out here. And it was kind of one of those good. things God put me in the right place, and what you said matched up perfectly with what's going on with you right now. Okay, so good. I really good. appreciate that. Gosh, that's uh, that's nice it to hear. It really good. did mean a lot, so thank okay, you. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for yeah. taking Thank you. Uh, I just kind of came in, and I didn't even know there was uh, like a speech yeah. going on, but I just came in. Yeah. I don't even uh, expect to take too much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Where are you? Karen Anderson here at the Ames office. Okay. I work in human resources. Okay.